Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. I'm so happy to meet you again in this very, very, very important project, really. Rule of point of care ultrasound in proper management of pulmonary embolism, uh, evidence based approach, part one. In this part, we'll talk about the great value of point of care ultrasound in management of case of thromboembolic disease and the pulmonary embolism. Uh, first part, we'll talk about the rule of echocardiography. And the second part, we'll talk about the rule of DVT study and the lung ultrasound in case of pulmonary infarction. It's a very important topic. We'll talk about all the areas in this uh, field, and you will see all the signs in point of care ultrasound you need to see in thromboembolic disease and you can consider this project as an archive you can review at any time to check your ability to get this important science in diagnosis pulmonary embolism is frequently underestimated underdiagnosed and under treated disease it's a tricky disease has in in, in mild to moderate case non-specific signs chest pain dyspnea syncope syncope hemopsis and in advanced situation, you can see hemodynamic instability. And this is what we are minded by because this is what we used to see in ICU. D-dimer is sensitive, but unfortunately non-specific. There is a lot of diseases can cause increase in D-dimer. CT pulmonary angio is a gold standard. It's a method of choice for imaging the vasculature in patients with suspected pulmonary breast. It allows adequate visualization of pulmonary arteries down to subsegmental level, but it's not 100% sensitive. It's 83% sensitive and specific 90-60% mainly for detector. And I am sure all of you here from your colleague in the radiology department, please, we cannot exclude the pulmonary umbilis because there is some areas, subsegmental areas cannot uh, reach and you can assess the patient clinically. You hear this a lot because it is not sensitive, it's 83% sensitive, but it is a gold standard. In this project, we'll talk about integrative approach, echo, DVT, and lung. And you will see the beauty and the great value of this approach. In ICU, and especially in the COVID-19 area, with a lot of unstable patient and a lot of hypercoagulable patient, you need bedside non-invasive effective way because most of my patients in ICU, I cannot send to CT because they are unstable really. And I need an uh, effective non-invasive way, bedside way. Point of care ultrasound, the great point of care ultrasound. First part, We'll talk about echocardiography, signs of acute pulmonary embolism in echocardiography. Echocardiography is important, but I'm sure you hear from the cardiology colleague, we cannot exclude the pulmonary embolism because there is two obstacles in echocardiography, and we'll see in this project how can come over of these two obstacles. Number one, it has high negative predictive value of almost 50%, so a negative result cannot exclude pulmonary embolism. Number two, signs of right ventricular overload or dysfunction, which appear as a sign of acute pulmonary embolism in echocardiography, may be found in absence of acute pulmonary embolism in concomitant cardiac, mitral stenosis, heart, left side heart failure, and respiratory disease in case of core pulmonary. But the good news, the type of patient we used to see in ICU with severe and massive pulmonary embolism, usually you will see signs or in echocardiography. Usually you will see the size. This is number one. Number two, we can really differentiate between the right ventricular overload of pulmonary embolism and the other chronic disease. You will see in the coming slides very clearly. I will build this uh, lecture on the 2019 guidelines of acute pulmonary embolism of European Society of Cardiology. You will see this great graph with all signs of pulmonary embolism 
in uh, acute pulmonary events in echocardiography, you will see here the dilated right side and four chamber view, deep shaped uh, left ventricle in uh, paracelar short axis view, dilated uh, inferior vena cava, thrombus, uh, 66 signs, low tapsy, low tissue doppler. Let us clarify these important signs in real patient I saw uh, uh, here. Okay. First, you see, you see here, the right ventricle has seen wall compared to the left ventricle. So, if you suddenly obstruct the pulmonary artery branches, big branches, by impulse in front of the right ventricle, this will cause acute pressure overload. This increased resistance and the pressure overload in front of the right ventricle with thin wall less than 0.5 cm will lead to dilatation of the right ventricle and the failure of the right ventricle. Number one, you will see in patient with acute pulmonary embolism and the acute core pulmonary dilated right side in forward chamber view, smaller than left side, usually right side is less than 60% of the diameter of the left side, and you will see failure of the lateral wall, weak lateral wall, and hyperactive apex, because the apex is shared by the hyperactive left ventricle, and this is the baconal sign, hyperactive apex compared to the free wall here, lateral wall here, no sickness at all, okay? It's the number one in the signs in the uh, graph of the European site of cardiology. Number two, with parasternal short axis view, because of dilated, overloaded right ventricle, will displace the septum which is shared between the two ventricles towards the left ventricle, and you will see D shaped left ventricle, especially in systole, and this is a pressure overload D shaped left ventricle in parasternal short axis view, and this. Increase pressure in the right ventricle will reflect back on the inferior vena cava, and you will see here dilated inferior vena cava. All these images you will see now only for, for one patient, and at what time, as you see here in the date and the time. And this is the whole package you will see, which is present in the European Society of Cardiology graph. Okay. This is another patient. They talk about, you can see the thrombus, and this is the gold standard way to diagnose the embolus. As you see here, you can see the thrombus in the right atrium of a patient here. And with the dilated, with the dilated right side and the pressure overload right side, the right side will fail. The contraction of the right ventricle is mainly up and down movement. So, you can measure this up and down movement by putting the M mode cursor parallel to the edge of the tricuspid valve, and you will see this contraction up and down movement, and you can measure it by the M mode here, what's called the TAPSI, which is tricuspid annular plan. Tricuspid valve annular plan systolic execution. The systolic execution of the tricuspid valve plan here, as you see here. This is the TAPSI. Uh, in European, in this uh, graph, they mention the normal is up to 1.6 centimeter. In uh, American uh, guidelines, it is 1.7. But here, as you see, in this patient, in our patient, you see 1.29, it is low. So, uh, the signs as you see here, rely on the acute pressure overload, acute corbalbunal, and acute failure of the right side, and dilatation. If the right ventricle dilate and fail, it will, it cannot generate tricuspid regurgitation here. There is resistance 
in front of the right ventricle and they increase in the pulmonary artery because of the presence of the clot in front of the pulmonary artery. This resistance and the clot in the pulmonary artery will reflect it back on the right ventricle and we can measure this pressure in the pulmonary artery, systolic pressure in the pulmonary artery by the extent of the tricuspid regurgitation here. So, if the right ventricle is weak, it cannot contract and cannot generate significant tricuspid regurgitation here. So, you will see the big systolic gradient here is low. We can measure the big systolic gradient by tricuspid regurgitation. It will be less than 60 millimeter mercury in our patient. It is 26. Tricuspid regurgitation is is uh, small tricuspid gauge because of uh, failed right ventricle and if you add 15 millimeter mercury of the dilated non-collapsing fear vena cava you are talking about around 40 millimeter mercury which is uh, less than 60 which is the first 60 in the 60 60 side what is the second 60 in the 66 time okay you will get this second 60 sign by Parasternal short axis view at the level of the great vessels. You will put the pulsed wave doppler at the pulmonary artery outflow tract here. And because the probe here and the flow is here, is going away from my probe, it will be below the baseline. And you will target what's called pulmonary valve or pulmonary artery acceleration time. You will look for this flow of the pulmonary artery and you will get the time of peak systolic flow, okay, by millisecond. This is called pulmonary valve acceleration time or pulmonary artery acceleration time and you will get it from the pulmonary artery flow. If the increase of pulmonary artery pressure here, which is 40 plus, is due to resistance in the pulmonary circulation like in pulmonary umbulis you will see this acceleration time is very short less than 60 milliseconds but if the increase in the pulmonary blood pressure is due to left side lesion like increased wedge pressure you will see pulmonary acceleration time is high more than 90 milliseconds so in our patient, as you see here, the same date and the same time, you will see the pulmonary hypertension here is due to increased resistance because of this upstroke, this rapid, quick upstroke here of the acceleration time due to pulmonary imbalance and resistance. And this is the explanation of 66 signs in the famous graph of the Rubian site of cardiology. What else? Acute or chronic core pulmonary. As you see, the guideline of American Society of Cardiology, it rely on the acute core pulmonar in diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, and this is the real, really. And the second obstacle of the echo is to differentiate between acute event like acute core pulmonar and the chronic event like mitral stenosis, left side failure, leading to pulmonary hypertension and right side strain, like a lung lesion, a chronic lung lesion, and chronic core pulmonar. How can you differentiate? Really, it's easy to differentiate, and you will see it's very clearly in the coming slides. Number one, uh, with time, the right ventricle can compensate by increasing the wall thickness and increase the muscle mass, and you will see increase in the diameter of the right ventricle in this patient in chronic core pulmonary. Uh, uh, right ventricular free wall thickness is very important to document the chronic uh, diagnosis, the chronic pathology, because of compensation. And practically, it may take two weeks to start to increase in uh, sickness, but with time, sickness increase more. But as you see here, the acute core pulmonary due to pulmonary embolism, the wall is seen because it has no time, it, it's, it, it didn't get enough time to compensate. Okay, but what is the end result of this increased thickness of the right ventricle? It became, it will become like left ventricle and may be more strong than left ventricle. As you see here, very clearly here, 
if you see the right ventricle compensated by chronic core pulmonal, it can generate now significant tricuspid regurgitation and increase big systolic gradient to more than 60 millimeter mercury in this patient. If you consider the inferior vena cava, which is 15, that means uh, big, uh, gra big systolic gradient here across the tricuspid valve is more than 60 millimeter mercury because the right ventricle now is strong enough to generate pressure and generate flow. But in this weak heart of acute core pulmonal, you will see very poor tricuspid regurg and very poor uh, big gradient across the tricuspid valve, which is less than 60. But you can see yourself this strong right ventricle very clearly by this picture, as you see here. Sick, strong right ventricle with visual tapsy, strong up and down movement of the right ventricle compared with this poor acute corporeal ventricle with very poor up and down movement. And you can measure this movement really by tapsy, as we said. Here, here is normal tapsy, here is poor tapsy because of poor right ventricular contraction. Okay, attention please. Why? We should differentiate between acute and chronic corporal pulmonal because this very important statement which we face in daily basis in ICU in a hemodynamically compromised patient with suspected pulmonary embolism unequivocal signs of right ventricular pressure overload especially with more specific echocardiographic finding 66 sign, maconal signs or right heart thrombus justify emergency reperfusion treatment for pulmonary embolism, if immediate CT pulmonary angio is not feasible. So, if you see a patient with acute core pulmonary with specific signs of acute pulmonary embolism, like 66 signs, maconal signs, and thrombus inside right side, and you cannot transfer your patient to CT pulmonary angio, or CT pulmonary angio is not available, you can start thrombolysis and save the life of your patient, especially if there is high suspicious clinically, and no other obvious cause of right ventricular pressure overload, and this you can see by echo also. Okay, this is good news, but unfortunately, the combination of the pulmonary ejection acceleration time, less than 60 millimeters millisecond, with a big systolic tricuspid regate less than 60 millimeters second, 66 sign, and the depressed contractility of right free wall compared to the apex, which is coronal sign, is suggestive of pulmonary embolism, which is specific sign of pulmonary embolism. Unfortunately, how, however, these findings are present in only 12 to 20 percent of unselected pulmonary embolism patients, respectively. So, what can we do? This will see very clearly to solve this problem very clearly by point of care ultrasound. In the part two of this project, will come very soon. But I, because it is very heavy meal, I, I, I need to divide in two parts. You will see how can the lower limb uh, DVT study and the lung ultrasound study to see the signs of pulmonary infarction, which is specific and sensitive, can help a lot, a lot with echocardiography as an integrative approach in proper management of uh, acute pulmonary embolism. See you in the part two. Uh, this will see very clearly in part two. Uh, and thank you now for watching. Oh, bye bye. See you soon.